Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on Defending the Mitigation Hierarchy in a Nature Positive Era. We have over 1,100 people registered today for the webinar from over 100 different countries, so thank you all for joining. We are so excited to have you here with us today. Today's webinar is being hosted in part by the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA. IAIA is the leading global network on using uh, best practice for impact assessment for making better and more informed decisions. Additionally, the webinar is being hosted by IUCN's IMEC, which you'll hear more about shortly. My name is Keisha Blazer. I work with IAIA, and I will be leading today's webinar, but you will mostly be hearing from our presenters, who you'll meet shortly. If you hear something today during the webinar that you'd like to share with your colleagues or your friends on socials, there is our Twitter handle, at IAIA Network, as well as a hashtag you can use to share anything that you would like. So I will tell you more about IAIA shortly. But Joe, if you would like to come on and share more about IMEC, please do so. Thank you, Keisha. So yes, um, IAIA decided to uh, collaborate with IMAC to give this webinar today. And I want to introduce IMAC to you because you're very welcome to uh, look it up and join if you think it's of interest to you. So. IMAC is the Impact Mitigation and Ecological Compensation Thematic Group, which is part of the IUCN's Commission on Ecosystem Management. And the aim of IMAC is to guide best practice application of the mitigation hierarchy and to improve alignment of impact mitigation and ecological compensation practice with, with the new biodiversity targets. Next slide, please. So some of the things that IMAX is doing that you might be interested in, um, as you'll see here on this slide, it intends to act as a central advisory group for best practice and to share updates and news on policy, things of topical interest, results of research, and to help provide some clarity on concepts that are sometimes complicated and sometimes appear to contradict one another. Um, IMAC has working groups on nature positive, on cumulative impacts, and on finance, governments, and implementation. And you'd be very welcome to think about joining those groups if you think you have relevant skills. Next slide, please. So um, you can click on these and check out what IMAC does, read more about it. And if you'd like to become a member of the IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management, select IMEC. So honestly, feel free to join. It's a great active group trying to do some really positive things to get us all up to speed with things that we need to know about to reverse biodiversity decline. Great. Next slide, please. Great. Thank you, Joe. So really quickly, I'm going to tell you more about IAIA and our website and some of the resources you can find there. So first, we have some webinars on demand, which are recordings of our past webinars. So you can see three there on the screen. First, we have Human Rights and Impact Assessment, which was delivered in Spanish, then Minimizing Risk in the Valuation of Unregistered Land, and Enhanced Environmentally Integrated Design. But we have webinars on a variety of topics, including health, biodiversity, resettlement, and many more. So please go to our website and check those out. Next up, I invite you to go to our website to check out information on our upcoming annual conference. So IAIA24 is going to be held in Dublin, Ireland. And the theme this year is Impact Assessment for a Just Transformation. The early bird registration for uh, getting a discount on registration is the 24th of January, which is just next week. So if you are interested in coming to the conference, please take a look at our website and see how you can take advantage of that savings. Next up, we also offer a variety of training. So we have online training courses, which are shorter form online courses, um, which have been taken from our conference in-person training courses and modified for an online delivery. And these are scheduled Zoom sessions that usually cover three or four days of about 12 hours total. So some of the upcoming courses that we have to offer are more effective impact assessment, tools for stronger argument and clearer writing. We have two different courses of that one um, to accommodate different time zones, so please check those out. Then we have a course on smarter monitoring and auditing for more effective implementation, as well as two new courses on leadership and conflict management in ESIA. Those ones, the registration is open, but we haven't yet started promoting those, so you're kind of going to be the first ones to see those if you go to our website. 
Additionally, in addition to our shorter form online courses, we also offer a more in-depth program called our Foundations of Impact Assessment PDP. And that is a 12-week course that is self-paced and all asynchronous. But the really interesting thing about that course is you are paired with a mentor expert who is able to guide you and give you feedback on your assessments and really just be, uh, like I said, a mentor for you uh, throughout that course. So if you're interested in that, please check out our website. And then finally, of course, we have plenty of resources for you to download. So whether you're looking for you know, something short and sweet, we have our IA Fast Tips, which are pretty quick reads. Otherwise, we also have some things that are more involved, like our best practice principles. So please check out our website and take a look. And lastly, before we get started, a few pieces of housekeeping. So first, yes, this webinar will be recorded. And since you are registered for it and you're here today, it will be emailed to you directly uh, in with including a link to the slides. So that should happen within a day or two. Otherwise, if you do want to share it sooner than that, it will be available on our website on demand within an hour or two of the, of the live webinar. So check back on our website to see that. And then next up, if you have questions today during the webinar, we will get to a Q&A portion towards the end, but I invite you to put your question in the, in the chat whenever you have it. So if you go to your control panel, you open up questions, you can type your question in there, and we will see those and flag those for the Q&A at the end. And I will also mention there too that, you know, we know that this webinar, there's a lot of different people on here and some of you are, you know, you've been working with this topic for a long time and some of you are maybe more new to this topic. So if you think that there, you know, if you have some interest in more of a primer on this topic and you'd like to hear another webinar that's kind of more basic about this to do more introductory information, please let me know that in the questions as well. Because if that, if there's a lot of interest for that, we would love to accommodate that and get a webinar scheduled. Okay, so with that, I want to introduce today's webinar uh, facilitator. You've kind of got to meet her already, Jo. Jo Trewick is the director at eCountability Limited, and she's also the co-chair of IAIA's Biodiversity and Ecology section. So with that, Jo, over to you. Thanks, Keisha, and thank you again, everyone, for being here. Um, just wanted to introduce this webinar by asking a little bit about why we decided to do it. So um, the theme of this webinar is whether Nature Positive offers a way forward for us as impact assessment pr practitioners who want to safeguard biodiversity. Um, will it have the outcomes we seek? Will it increase investment in nature? Will it reverse losses of biodiversity from development? And are there any possible perverse outcomes from taking a nature positive position, which on the face of it has to be all good. Nobody can argue with, with nature positive outcomes. Next slide, please. And there's some other background to this around global and national policy on biodiversity at the moment. Um, and as everyone will be acutely aware, we're in a situation where we have a biodiversity extinction crisis and at the same time our global and national policies are trying to respond to that and do something to reverse biodiversity declines. So we end up with increasing levels of decline combined with higher levels of ambition to try and tackle that decline and that's resulted in this um, new emphasis on taking a nature positive approach. And businesses and corporate organizations have also recognized that something needs to change and they've shifted from a position of seeking no net loss of biodiversity to seeking net gain or a net positive impact or a nature positive outcome. And in parallel with that, new nature markets have emerged which are allowing trade in nature credits in the way that carbon credits have been traded. So this is some of the background for why we, we wanted to run this webinar and really have a session to think about what all this means for us on the ground and whether it should change anything about how we practice um, assessment of impacts on biodiversity when we're planning and delivering development. Next slide, please. Um, as many of you will have been acutely aware, we've been working for many, many years on how to strengthen the mainstream of biodiversity into environmental impact assessment and into planning of development. And within 
planning and delivery of infrastructure development, the mitigation hierarchy has been a key conceptual framework. And there have been a lot of international initiatives that have looked at the mitigation hierarchy and how to make sure that it gives us an appropriate level of avoidance of impacts on biodiversity, moving through a strict hierarchy to the point where we might consider compensating for losses that it hasn't been possible to avoid. But it's true to say that despite all this effort and despite development of principles, standards and a lot of guidance on how to do this well, there are a lot of failures and we don't always succeed. So the question is, will putting a net positive target on the end of the mitigation hierarchy change that? Next slide, please. So when you registered for this um, webinar, uh, we asked you a couple of questions and some of you were kind enough to answer that. And one of the questions we asked was, are we positive about nature positive? Well, we didn't ask it that way. We asked whether using a nature positive position to frame impact assessment would improve outcomes for biodiversity. And overwhelming, overwhelmingly, you thought it would. In fact, um, although quite a few of you were not entirely sure, the number of people who thought it wouldn't improve outcomes for biodiversity was tiny. Um, a handful of people out of the overall audience. So that's, that's of interest. And on that note, um, just to mention a few examples of some things that some of you said. Um, absolutely, a new standard that goes over and above, no net loss, sets the bar higher. No net loss simply maintains the status quo. Um, we have to go beyond avoiding harm and aim to enhance and restore ecosystems. This encourages good environmental management. The few people who said no, they weren't convinced that a nature positive position would change things in the direction we want to go, said that we did need binding rules and that a lot would depend on local regulation. And some people thought we should focus more on degrowth uh, rather than growth all the time that might not be sustainable. And importantly, that net positive must build on no net loss first. And on that note, I think I'll hand over to our presenter today, Megan Evans. So um, Megan is a senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales in Canberra, Australia, and specialises in environmental policy, governance and finance. And her current work is looking at the growth of private sector investment in biodiversity and natural capital. And she's going to give us a, a good presentation today about nature positive and what it means for the mitigation hierarchy. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping I'm sharing my correct screen. Um, thank you so much for the introduction and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I just wanted to first acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded country of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, also known as the city of Canberra in Australia. And I'd like to pay my respects to uh, elders past and present, and also extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and other Indigenous peoples uh, in the audience today. Now, um, this uh, presentation or this, this presentation is uh, uh, primarily based on an article that was uh, published recently and uh, is very much a, a collaborative effort um, led by all of the wonderful people uh, you see on the screen here. And, and together, um, including, including Jo, uh, you know, represents you know, decades of, of expertise and experience in uh, impact assessment policy and practice. Now, uh, the, the, the actual article is uh, behind the, the paywall, thanks to the, the wonders of scientific publishing, 
but um, the the um, the good thing is is that you can email me uh, uh, using the email on the the screen or any of these other authors um, contact them from for a PDF of the article and they will very happily share it to you individually. So please do that if you are interested uh, to read the the article. Now. Um, if you were to tune out of the, the webinar at this point um, and you just took in this meme, you would probably get 80% of the content. So um, what we're really showing here or, or highlighting here is the, the concern that a lot of us have, um, the authors of this um, article, that um, nature positive is the, the new thing on the block and um, uh, corporates and, and governments and EONGOs are, are very much you know, interested in this idea, uh, but the poor old mitigation hierarchy is at risk of, of being forgotten. And so um, uh, you know, we're here to tell you about why we think the mitigation hierarchy uh, still needs to be very much front and centre in the nature positive era. Now, um, I know this, uh, this audience um, uh, may well be already very familiar with the mitigation hierarchy, but just, just to uh, quickly recap, uh, the mitigation hierarchy has underpinned environmental regulation pretty much everywhere in the world uh, for decades. Uh, the basic principle is that for when you know, uh, dealing with, with any kind of environmental or social impacts of, of economic development, uh, there's a, a strict uh, hierarchy to go through whereby uh, first we want to avoid um, uh, impacts, then minimise, then restore on site. And only after all of these steps are exhausted and only when feasible uh, should any remaining residual impacts be offset uh, by uh, delivering a, a gain somewhere else. Now the theory, the economic theory that underpins this idea is that by doing this, this hierarchy and then by uh, uh, deprioritizing the offset portion is that it maximizes social welfare by essentially placing a price on nature via the offset. So when, if the, the price of the offset is small because you have done a really good job of avoiding and minimizing and restoring impacts, then maybe it makes economic sense to do the offset rather than to stop the development. When the price of the offset is high, that is a very good indication that uh, there needs to be uh, more adherence, more avoidance, more, more minimization, um, because if you've got a high price of an offset, then that's a good indicator that that is a very uh, potentially a very rare and threatened uh, part of the environment that, that you're wanting to remove. And there's a number of um, uh, principles um, in that offsets should be additional. They should um, uh, deliver a, a gain that wouldn't have occurred anyway. So something that, um, that wouldn't uh, have already occurred under regulation or, or, or policy. They should be like for like, so the type of nature or biodiversity uh, that is impacted, it should be compensated with the same biodiversity or, or nature um, that, that is intended to be offset. And the, the, the basic principle is that uh, they should deliver, the whole uh, process should deliver an overall no net loss, so neutral, or, or net gain outcome. The problem with uh, the mitigation hierarchy is not really the mitigation hierarchy itself, but how we have historically applied it or continue to apply it. Now, the, the snapshots that you see on the screen here are primarily taken from Australia, which is where I'm from. Um, you know, I, I work in Australia and I, I share things about Australian policy um, because, you know, you know, we are a rich country. Australia is a wealthy country. Um, we uh, uh, theoretically have very good governance and we really have no excuse uh, to have poor policy. 
Um, we really should be world leaders in applying and, and doing well at the mitigation hierarchy. And unfortunately, uh, we kind of suck at it. Um, it it's, there's you know, multiple, multiple long-term instances of uh, mitigation hierarchy and offsets uh, not being applied correctly. Uh, there's a couple of articles on the left, uh, the first by Sofa Zu Ermgassen, who did a global review recently, and they did an international analysis, um, and, and one that I led um, uh, looking at Australian uh, policy specifically. So what is the relationship between mitigation hierarchy and this new uh, or relatively new term nature positive? The key message that we want to communicate here is that nature positive is an extension to the mitigation hierarchy. It's not a replacement. Um, it's not about an upgrade from, you know, one piece, one jargonistic term to another, uh, but it's actually about a change. Oopsies. Sorry, I don't know what, I accidentally pressed something. I think I am now showing the slide again, I apologize. Um, we can see okay, you. Now showing. Sorry, now showing the application, my apologies. So um, I was, all I was really doing was attempting to move my doodad so I could see my slide. Um, now, what do we mean when we talk about relative and absolute outcomes? Okay, so if you look at this graph here, um, you can see that this uh, uh, red line um, uh, is, uh, is of decline. This is your, your essentially your business as usual scenario of, of biodiversity decline. Now, if we were to deliver a net gain relative to that baseline or that counterfactual, we're not actually overall leading to an increase in, in the trajectory. We're simply slowing the trajectory of decline um, such that uh, we've now got the, the orange line. So it's a relative net gain. Um, but not uh, an absolute net gain, which is this, this green line. Now to explain this a, a little bit more, I'll, I'll take you to the next slide. So here's, uh, here is this, this trend again, this existing trend of biodiversity loss. And, um, uh, as you can see, we're 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 largely in decline. I mean, it's I don't think it's um, controversial to say that you know biodiversity loss or what biodiversity trend is is of decline. There are certainly places where it, we're not really declining as rapidly, um, but as a, as a general theme, we are in a state of uh, biodiversity decline. Now, if we were to think about what is no net loss compared to that existing trend. Um, this is what we're looking at. So when we talk about no net loss, what we're actually going to be delivering. So if we, if we, uh, uh, you know, follow the mitigation hierarchy and do offsetting perfectly, the absolute best that we do is actually maintain that decline. So earlier in the webinar where we, where we talked through some of those answers to those questions, uh, there was one person who, who indicated that, well, yes, no net loss and offsetting is really just maintaining existing trends. And that is exactly right. What is net positive or, or gain relative to that trend? Then, well, yes, we are getting a slightly less bad um, trend. We are improving, um, but ultimately uh, we, are, we are slowing the rate of biodiversity decline. Now that actual, you know, the, where exactly that um, uh, purple line is could be a range of different places. You know, it depends on, you know, policy, 
or, or what we might hope to achieve, you know, how exactly how positive or how net positive we might want to be relative to that uh, no net loss benchmark. It could be, you know, slowing that, that rate of decline, like where that fuzzy uh, purple um, line is, or it could even be something like this, you know, anything within the, the bounds of that purple um, blob is uh, net positive. So it, it highlights the question of, well, exactly how, how much net gain or how net positive do we want to be? And that's, that's very much a question of policy. What is nature positive relative to all that? Well, it is very much something quite different. We are not just slowing the decline. We are wanting to deliver an absolute gain, uh, an absolute uh, increase in nature. And, uh, you know, people say things like, oh, we don't really know what nature positive means. And I find that very confusing because you can go to naturepositive.org and there is a, a quite a clear and specific uh, definition there um, where it's, you know, there's some very important things there. Now, you know, appreciate that there's nuances about how do we actually operate, operationalise nature positive in, in particular contexts, but there's, there's two very important pieces of information in that, that, you know, broad global definition. One is that the, to achieve nature positive, we must halt and reverse nature loss measured from a baseline of 2020. So we're talking about a fixed historical baseline rather than uh, a, you know, a counterfactual or a baseline that could be you know, from any time point or, or any kind of, of trend. So we're, we're kind of stepping away from this kind of discretion that uh, policy and practice has a lot of the time in, you know, defining what is that counterfactual to, okay, get rid of all that. We're really talking about a, a baseline of 2020. Just, you know, just to put a circle on, on, a, on, a, on a graph. Um, and that has the, the effect of saying, let's, let's, we're drawing a line in the sand and, you know, we can probably assume that we're, we're still in decline. But importantly, by 2030, we are visibly and measurably on the path of nature recovery. And even if you just look at where 2020 and 2030 are, uh, and you know the green line on that graph and, and the other graphs, which is you know we're pretty much uh, very much in the the orange zone at the moment of no net loss. Uh, there is there needs to be a massive change, a massive increase in in activity and action in order to come anywhere near uh, this ambition of nature positive. So the effect or the 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 consequence of uh, wanting to become nature positive is that we need much more additional conservation in order to achieve nature positive, but that conservation cannot be simply in exchange for losses because any kind of compensation for loss via offsets or even credits, it simply keeps nature in the red. We're actually, any time we uh, use an offset or credit um, that isn't kind of delivering much you know, much more in addition relative to what it's compensating for, we are keeping the trends in this uh, existing no net loss or net positive trends. Um, and, and I would argue that nature positive becomes even harder to achieve if we very much entrench uh, the use of offsets and credits in lieu of uh, you know, applying the mitigation hierarchy plus a whole lot more. So nature positive is very much an extension. It's not a replacement. Um, it doesn't just, we're not just talking about different trajectories of decline or, or, or increase. We're actually extending beyond just biodiversity to all other aspects of nature, non-living non and living, as well as we're not just talking about project level, um, we're talking about entire value chains. So at the 
project, the company scale, and, and the entire value chain. So there is very much an increase in ambition in, um, in scale or, or magnitude of action, as well as the scope of action. So achieving nature positive requires all of these things. It requires fully applying the mitigation hierarchy for direct footprint impacts, uh, increasing uh, the effectiveness. Um, so doing all the things that we should have been kind of doing anyway, plus increasing its ambition to uh, apply the mitigation hierarchy to uh, different scale or scopes of action, um, uh, indirect or value chain, other nature impacts, and third, um, additional investment in conservation and restoration that goes far beyond compensation of impacts in order to ultimately achieve this absolute gain. What nature positive doesn't mean and I'm, I'm drawing heavily on uh, E.J. Milner Gullen's uh, piece uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, calling individual activities or outcomes nature positive. Um, nature positive is, a, is an overarching goal whereby different activities or outcomes could contribute to achieving, but uh, I don't believe that any individual action or, or outcome can be classified as necessarily nature positive itself. It doesn't mean skipping over the strict uh, requirements of the mitigation hierarchy in favour of so-called nature positive investments. And so, you know, that second point is highlighting, you know, the danger of calling individual um, activities or outcomes nature positive, because how do you know whether um, the mitigation hierarchy has actually been applied in order to do that other thing. It also doesn't mean just saying, oh, that sounds nice, focusing only on the positives and the opportunities rather than, um, or, or whilst ignoring or obfuscating uh, losses. Um, there is uh, a lot of greenwashing risks with uh, nature positive. So here's, um, in a little bit more detail, I'm going to take you through this, this diagram and I'm going to go from left to right. This is uh, from the article that we published um, late last year. So at the project level, what is nature positive? What does uh, nature positive look like if it is actually going to help tackle the biodiversity crisis? So here you can see there's losses and gains. There have been avoidance and minimisation of impacts and you know, from first glance, you can see that the losses and gains at the project level um, are equivalent. So that's good. Um, we can also see that there's different colours of, of green. So the, the light green signifies, you know, portions of nature and biodiversity that are you know, easy to restore or common. And the dark green are those that are hard to restore or highly threatened. So you can see that you know with the gains, with the, the, the offsets that are being delivered, they're like for like. We're actually you know compensating for all the different parts of nature um, it, at that project. So this is a good application of the mitigation hierarchy and use of offsets. And if we go to the right, uh, at the value chain level, we can kind of, you know, there's a bit of um, uh, we can see how it gets a bit harder to really identify and, and trace what are the various um, nature and biodiversity losses and gains. So, you know, you can see that the, the distinguishment between the, the easy to restore and the hard to restore gets a little bit fuzzier, but overall the, the, the losses and gains are equivalent. We are actually applying the mitigation hierarchy appropriately. And then on the far right, uh, these are the non-compensatory actions. So we are doing, you know, nature restoration um, of all various different types, both the easy and the hard to restore. And we are doing that on top of um, all of that mitigation hierarchy efforts. And we're not uh, doing these nature and biodiversity gains in exchange for losses. So we are actually going above and beyond uh, the mitigation hierarchy. So this is these, this you know, top half of the diagram highlights what a, a, a nature positive approach 
um, actually would look like that um, would help deal with biodiversity loss. Bottom here is an example of how the term nature positive could be uh, misused as, as greenwash. So on the left hand side, the bottom left, we can see that there are more losses than gains overall. We haven't done as good a job at avoiding and minimising impacts. The other thing to highlight is that we are, have proportionately much more losses of the hard to restore or highly threatened kind and the, the gains, the compensation, are not really like for like. Um, we've got, you know, much, we're, we're delivering gains that are much more, you know, uh, easy to restore or common. So there are some highly threatened or hard to restore biodiversity in nature that ultimately are not being compensated for. So we are not um, protecting those, those species or ecosystems and they are, you know, uh, going to be more endangered as a result. And as we go to the right, the bottom bottom middle, um, similar thing we can see, you know, at the value chain level, there are more losses than gains, and the gains might be delivered by some, you know, potentially some some generic, uh, relatively cheap um, credits that could be purchased. Um, uh, somehow to compensate for losses, which uh, are much uh, more in amount and uh, include some high, highly threatened and hard to restore biodiversity that are again not being compensated. And then on the far right, the bottom bottom right, again, we're getting some gains, but none of the gains, the gains don't include some of these um, hard to restore or highly threatened biodiversity. It's the cheap and easy biodiversity that um, environmental markets tend to uh, favour. Now, um, being from Australia, and um, for whatever reason, Australia tends to, um, you know, really enjoy um, uh, experimenting with environmental markets. And there, I know that, you know, uh, it's it's um, the nature repair scheme has been of interest to a, a lot in the international community because it is uh, apparently um, the first um, national legislated voluntary. Uh, biodiversity scheme. Uh, it has been kind of going around the traps in Parliament for the last year or so, um, but at the end of last year, in the last sitting week of Parliament, it managed to get through the Australian Senate and has now become law um, as a bit of kind of political horse trading. Um, but the, the critical thing um, with the Nature Repair Scheme, um, I've crossed out the market because technically the scheme is they got rid of the market because that was part of the horse trading. Anyway, um, the key part of this uh, scheme was that the current Australian government was really hoping to use the Nature Repair Scheme uh, to generate offsets for uh, regulated environmental impacts under national environmental laws, um, which A, contradicts with the whole, you know, voluntary scheme idea, as well as contradicting with the proposal to, for it to actually deliver, you know, nature positive outcomes. But um, the key thing is that certificates um, that are generated from the nature repair scheme um, there has been, you know, it's put into law now that those certificates cannot be used to compensate or offset regulated environmental losses under Australian federal, state or territory environmental laws. So the demand for these uh, certificates generated in the market should now be purely uh, voluntary, but that certainly doesn't rule out um, uh, private entities from uh, using those certificates um, to compensate for non-regulated And I'm going to highlight here uh, briefly, uh, you know, this is all part of a larger package um, of environmental law reform in Australia, and this is a very live issue. And the reason why I'm highlighting what's going on in environmental law in Australia is because of the very heavy use of the term nature positive. Um, the current government really loves it. Um, unfortunately, the way they love it is that they think it's a really cool term 
um, but they're using it in a way to conceal some quite significant policy regressions that they're planning to progress as part of this law reform. So under the, the draft piece of legislation, they're basically getting rid of like for like in, uh, offsetting. Um, uh, so direct you know, offsets um, can, must still be like for like, but proponents entirely have an option of, of doing that or not. They can simply just pay and go. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's provisions under the law whereby um, if it turns out that uh, we don't need to do like for like, um, decision makers can say, well, that's fine, as long as a more general environmental outcome is quote unquote better overall. Now, who decides what is better overall and how is unclear. Um, and as I and others have pointed out, um, saying that, well, allowing the loss of highly threatened species um, uncompensated um, is essentially deciding which species go extinct, um, but, but using some slightly more positive language to conceal these losses. And I'm going to finish up in a moment because I know that we do want to get to some discussion. Um, obviously, there's been some very uh, uh, heightened discussion around biodiversity credits. Um, you know, these are largely my views, and I'm sure Francisco and Joe may have their own views that we can we can discuss in a moment. But the way biodiversity credits, voluntary biodiversity credits, have been defined is partly being defined as as not offsets. Uh, by saying that credits are not intended to facilitate uh, offsetting or compensation, or they aim to contribute to biodiversity net gain, which, as I highlighted earlier, could mean anything really, um, uh, anywhere between no net loss and nature positive, um, or part of a company's nature positive journey, whatever that means. Um, and I'll merely point out that, well, intentions are not the same as impact. And, you know, I've spoken to a number of um, uh, people and organisations who are planning to, you know, put up uh, biodiversity credits for sale. And, um, you know, they don't want credits to be used as offsets. Um, but, um, you know, in the absence of policy and regulation, while this is in the voluntary space, um, you know, corporations can really use them as, as however they like. Um, and so if a, if a company or corporation is purchasing biodiversity credits, even if they're really, really good and making a, a nature positive claim, whilst ignoring or not quantifying the losses that are occurring in their value chain, um, in my view, it's still a form of compensation um, and potentially greenwash. So what does this all mean? Uh, for policy, um, you know, markets, are geared towards supply and achieve an easy biodiversity gains. That's just the way they work. So public policy has to be there as a guardrail to prevent losses of our most threatened and uh, hard to restore or impossible to restore biodiversity. There needs to be public finance or public funding to, to fund the difficult and expensive repair work and lead by example and not engage in diluted or misleading my nature positive claims. Now, given that we've got a lot of practitioners on the call, I've just put together a few points uh, for practice. Um, I would strongly suggest that not just sellers, but credit, uh, sorry, credit buyers and sellers should be conducting due diligence. So if you're a biodiversity credit seller, um, consider, well, who should I be selling to? Um, is, is the potential buyer of this credit are they actually really trying hard to avoid and minimise and, and their biodiversity impacts? And you know, have they got a biodiversity strategy? Uh, or is there a risk that um, they will be engaging in, in greenwash? Uh, there are, you know, whether or not you, you, you intend to mislead or not, um, greenwashing, you know, there are legal ramifications for this. So, you know, for example, under Australian cons consumer law, it doesn't matter whether your misleading uh, is deliberate or not. It still carries the same legal uh, risks. And ultimately, uh, skipping over the mitigation hierarchy and buying credits, 
um, instead of doing this, really kicks the can down the road and compounds future environmental and economic risks. So I will finish up there and um, keen to hear questions. We lost Keisha. <laughs> oh, great. OK, so it's not just me. That's wonderful. Um, OK, everyone. So uh, Megan, thanks for your great presentation. And sorry for that strategic pause. Um, we seem to have lost Keisha temporarily. But if I could, I would like to introduce Francisco Gomez to you all, who has stepped in at very, very short notice because um, Mariano, who was going to be our panelist, um, was delayed on a flight. So um, Francisco works for Terrasos. He's the chief operating officer there where he's responsible for managing and supervising all technical aspects of the company, as well as leading the development of new and innovative solutions. Um, hence this interest in Nature Positive. He has more than 15 years of experience in managing projects that integrate engineering the environment and social development. Uh, so we're very glad he can be with us here today. And I'm just going to ask him to um, say a little bit more about himself um, before we go into um, tackling some of the very good questions that you've posted up. Thank you, Joe. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Megan, for, for a great presentation. Um, OK, so I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm Francisco Gomez. Um, I first wanted to introduce Terrazos, um, which is basically a, a Colombian company founded 10 years ago by, by Mariana Sarmiento, whom I'm replacing now. Um, but basically the purpose of, of Terrazos uh, is to protect highly threatened ecosystems in, in Colombia and in Latin America uh, through uh, what we call exceptional conservation projects. And what that means basically is that we, we have a, um, an interest in, in high integrity conservation projects. Um, they're called habitat banks. And because in Colombia um, we have what I consider robust regulation or environmental regulation, um, including the mitigation hierarchy and, and offsetting. Um, basically, Habitat Banks is a results-based mechanism for implementing offsets uh, for companies that require uh, it through their obligations uh, for licensing permits. Um, because of that, we've also worked on uh, voluntary biodiversity credits, uh, again, as, as an addition to the work we do uh, with compensation or, or with offsets. Um, and we also have a, a consultancy unit uh, that basically helps um, companies uh, with everything regarding environmental regulation in, in Colombia um, for them to be able to comply. Uh, and also um, we try to help them build uh, environmental or, or biodiversity investment portfolios so that uh, we can actually um, make make biodiversity uh, positive and and not just uh, greenwash, as, as Megan was saying. Um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, I think that's me. Thank you, thank you very much. So we've actually had some great questions come in, and you'll all be able to see them um, yourselves but I'm just going to put some of these questions to, to Megan and to Francisco and let's see what they have to say. So um, one of the first ones we had in was from Mark Johnston, who said that, of course, the mitigation hierarchy has been with us for years. Nature positive is a more recent concept. And he says that some of the feedback and comments 
from business so that biodiversity is seen as very complex and full of technical jargon? Do you think we need to change the language we use to explain these concepts to businesses? So Francisco, I think I'll put that question to you first. Okay, um, I, I agree in a way. I mean, I think, I think it is in our best interest to actually explain all of this better. Um, also to explain, uh, just as Megan was doing, the evolution of these concepts and, and how they're supposed to build on one another and not replace each other. Um, but it's, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's like the, it's, it's not going to be the end game if, if we just change the language to make it simpler. Uh, it, is, it is a complex subject and, and uh, complexity needs to come into the discussion. Uh, nevertheless, I do think that in terms of the solutions, um, we do need to make them simpler. We do need to make them high integrity. We need to set the bar high for companies to be able to comply uh, easily um, and not to, be a, to, to have to build huge capacities uh, for this to occur. Uh, so I think it's a collaborative effort um, from the, the side of, of, of the ones that understand conservation um, to the ones that are obliged to comply with, with regulation. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it is a, an interesting question. Yeah, I Being devil's forgot. advocates, do you think other aspects are complex, like engineering or hydrological modeling? I, just, just to say, you know, do, do we think biodiversity is more complex than some of these other technical aspects that everyone has to deal with no i i don't think so i mean if, if, if you talk to, to oil companies or mining companies each of them have their own complex uh issues around what they do and and that's their speciality uh but you do need to understand that they're not specialized in biodiversity and that's why you require uh others to be specialized in biodiversity i think i think that's a that's a real issue um, the same as when you speak with experts in biodiversity, they'll probably won't understand the nitty gritty of, of oil um, drilling or, or hydroelectric power stations. Um, nevertheless, um, I think it's, I mean, it's in the interest of, of all of us to be able to speak to one another and, and, and understand that this is, this is also science and and there are common grounds in science to, to be able to discuss everything. Thank you. Sorry, Megan. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'll just say, I, I mean, any elimination of any jargon where necessary or where, where possible, I think is great. I mean, jargon, yeah, there, there, there's, there's jargon that is kind of important and necessary and some jargon, arguably nature positive, that is just, why are we doing this? Um, but, you know, there is this real desire, it seems, for, okay, well, look, we just need to deal with this thing. We've, we've, had, we've had climate, we've, we've, um, you know, we're dealing with climate-related financial risks. We've got biodiversity now, all right, we need to fit that into the, the same system. There's this kind of desire to have, you know, a, a unit of biodiversity that is analogous to the unit of, of, of carbon for, um, you know, for climate. Uh, or to and or to incorporate biodiversity in nature within our existing systems. You know, I've, I've heard you know bankers and financial analysts say, well, we've got our system, and we just need to get nature and deal with nature decision making within our existing system, because you know that's how business deals with things. It you know it just okay. What's the next thing we need to do? Okay, we need to shoehorn that into into our existing decision making framework and. I get that, I sympathise that, but at the same time, biodiversity and nature, they're relational. They're, they, they can't be entirely shoehorned into existing systems. The existing system is kind of the problem. Um, so there does, I think, need to be some recognition that we might need to try to adapt our decision-making and systems around this problem rather than shoehorning it into the existing system that demonstrably 
doesn't, you know, isn't compatible with nature and biodiversity. But also, you know, as you were pointing out below, uh, before, you know, we have companies hire so many other specialists for, you know, engineering, whatever. It, it points to the, the need or points to the fact that this is real science. Environmental science is an impact assessment, a genuine professional expertise uh, that you can't just acquire from doing a, a, an eight week you know, online course um, and, you know, with a new renewed passion for nature, you're now the, you know, acting head of sustainability for Corporation A. Like, hire ecologists and hire environmental scientists. You know, you actually have to buy this professional, genuine expertise. You can't just, you know, say, all right, we care about nature now and expect things to work out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think some of the other questions we had, um, you've helped to answer those. So some people asked if you think nature can be traded. Um, and also a couple of questions actually about value chains and how do you apply the mitigation hierarchy well through value chains? So Marissa Balfour asked, are you imagining the AR3T framework, e.g. avoiding conversion, reducing identified harmful impacts, looking at impacted land footprint, or do you envisage something much more quantified? Because that's not currently possible. And then also um, Joshua Berger asked, could you clarify if you think biodiversity credits could be used to counterbalance negative impacts in the value chain? This would be different from like for like regulatory offsets focused on habitats for species, but would follow the requirements in your article. So Megan, do you have any thoughts on value chains and how to apply the mitigation hierarchy in those? Look, I mean, value chains are not my area of expertise. Um, I'm really just learning from, from others who are kind of working in that space and, and Francisco may have some, um, some um, views to share. Look, I think, you know, the discussion around biodiversity credits is partly in recognition of the fact that uh, understanding value chain impacts is really hard. Um, so I really sympathise with the, um, you know, and going to the question of, you know, can biodiversity credits deal with those value chain impacts? And maybe, um, you know, to an extent, but they're, you know, I, I, I think there does need to still be the the hard kind of difficult work of really just trying to assess and understand where those impacts are. And it's not necessarily, you know, going through and having to quantify everything, you know, in, in massive fine scale. I think there's, you know, there's some kind of qualitative risk assessment where if you're if your product primarily comes from this location, you know the primary threat uh, to biodiversity in that location is, you know, X. Um, okay, uh, how do we ensure that the um, you know, the activities that we're investing in for conservation are commensurate, broadly commensurate with uh, the impacts that we're having? So, you know, uh, there is, you know, and certainly from the carbon credit world, there's, you know, carbon. Uh, brokers love to kind of say things like, well, you need to do everything. You need to buy credits. You need to do this. You need to do that. And yes, I, I sympathize again with the, all right, start buying some credits potentially now, but also uh, moderation, you know, you, you kind of want to still be investing in the hard work of identifying value chain impacts. And you know, because regulation is kind of not really there yet, it's it's going to come down to whether consumers and you know eventually financial regulators and shareholders uh, believe that the credits that you're purchasing are effectively addressing your nature but nature related financial risks. Um, uh, yeah, so it's I, I I would be cautious about rushing into it, but also you know, again, doing a lot of due diligence and recognising that even if you do buy some really good credits, which, you know, would be great, um, you still need to do that that hard work of figuring out your value chain impacts. But that's, 
that's a long-term thing and not just, okay, where's the best metric? All right, job done. Um, you, Joe, you, you mentioned a lot of questions, so, so I'm going to just to try to, to, to bring them all together. Um, mm -hmm. First, how, how do you apply the mitigation hierarchy right? I think, I think it's, it's an important question because sort of what we're defending. And, and it, it comes to what we were talking about in the, in the, last, in the last question. Um, the mitigation hierarchy has to be measurable. Now, this has to include uh, a lot of instruments, um, policy instruments, to be able to apply it. Um, for example, uh, environmental alternative diagnostics, um, environmental impact assessments, um, this being uh, analyzed with work plans, uh, and then once you actually try to avoid, prevent, minimize, mitigate, and then uh, compensate or offset um, your work, can, can you actually think that mitigation hierarchy has been applied? And this is very challenging because not just because you need clear regulation, um, but you know you also need data, a lot of data, both in baselines and in monitoring, and you need um, an authority, an environmental authority, with the capacity to actually have a conversation with project developers uh, in order to be able to construct um, that mitigation hierarchy. Um, that's that's really important because once once you understand that, you get to to that point now where, where the other question was, is, is nature tradable? So, I mean, no, like in, in, a, in a conceptual term, it might not be, uh, but the idea of licensing is that we are getting benefits out of development you know, for communities, for countries, for regions. And because of that, we, we need rules to be able to, to create that development and bring um, welfare to people, but try to do it in the best way possible. So, so yes, I, I think it, it then becomes tradable. Markets, um, markets are the way so that we can actually bring the amounts of resources that we actually need in the short amount of time that we have uh, for this not to go overboard. Um, and once, once you, you understand that then, for those companies that are licensed, that have obligations, then there will be a set of rules in order to apply the hierarchy of mitigation. Um, but then, then the value chains. I think what, what you need to understand is that you basically have to follow the same steps. Everyone should be thinking about their impacts in terms of carbon, but also in terms of biodiversity. And for that, you need to, to diagnose you need to measure and then you need to manage. Um, and when you think about it that way, the, the mitigation hierarchy is just the same framework to follow. And also, once you understand where you are, once you, you understand what you need to measure, you'll have to apply the mitigation hierarchy yourself, whether it's mandatory or not, whether it's uh, regarding compliance or not. Because the first thing, the most cost-effective thing for you to do is to avoid or prevent things that you know, that, that, that might change the way you, you manage or, or measure your, your impacts. And then you need to minimize, then you need to mitigate that. Of course, you finally need to compensate what you can't avoid. And that's where the voluntary markets come in. Um, and again, the idea of the markets is that you can basically set the rules, you know, like the standard for what should be high integrity projects so that you don't have to build them yourself, so that you can actually go to a place where you can buy those. Um, but again, it, it, yeah, it, it should be done correctly so that you don't you don't just get greenwash all over the place. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and actually, somebody mentioned um, that maybe you know, as time goes on, people who greenwash and try and fudge things might be liable for prosecution um, or liable for making false claims. So yeah, I think it's in the interest of everyone to apply some rigorous thinking all the time. And, and in a way, nature positive kind of plays to the fact that 
a new mindset is needed. And as Megan said, it's not just about slotting biodiversity into existing structures. It's about a new conceptual approach that is a little bit more enlightened to some of the risks that go with failing to safeguard these important assets that we have. So that's very good. Um, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but just regarding what you said, I, I mean, I'm all for not supporting greenwash, but this is also very relative. I mean, if you, if you're comparing if you're comparing companies that you know, are are not doing a proper job but want to greenwash their way uh, through reputation you know, regarding consumers and environment, mm -hmm. I understand that's bad, but it might be worse if you're just not doing anything. And if you're not even trying, and if not, you, you you're not even investing in it, and you, you you're just keeping quiet. Um, yeah. I know it's a, no, it's it's quite a discussion and, and a big one, um, but I think I think uh, uh, it needs to be taken with a with a pinch of salt, uh, because sometimes I mean we're 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 urgently in need of of investments in conservation and in restoration projects. Um, yeah, but I suppose greenwashing can also include um, taking people's money and not delivering the goods. So that's a little bit more serious. Yeah, Quite a fraud, yeah but, isn't it? Like, you know, taking yeah. money to do something and you're not actually doing it. Yeah. Which, no, which is sure. one of the things the carbon market has been criticised of. So, yeah, it is something that we need to guard against. Um, so we have so many questions and I think I'm gonna to have to just say that if we don't get back to you now because we run out of time, um, it's not because you didn't ask great questions and we'll try and respond um, subsequently. And I would encourage all of you on this webinar to hook into the IAI hub uh, because that's actually a good place to post some of this stuff. So if you want an ongoing discussion, we can use the IAI hub to continue. Um, and Joe, we, we, we are about Sorry. five minutes over, Joe, so I, we do need to wrap up here. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I right. know. Sorry, I'm having such a good time with all the questions, but I'm, I'm sorry we seem to run out of time. So um, if you're still here and you're not leaving, uh, we were going to run another poll just to see if you still feel the same about Nature Positive, having, having gone through this webinar. But... Um, We'll just put it up in case you have interest to, to do it. Um, and if you can, that would be fun, um, just to see if we managed to convince you um, to have some healthy reservations about using Nature Positive as the answer to everything. Um, so yeah, we have a few more people not so sure and a few more no's than we had at the beginning so i think that's um that has to be a good thing still it's still an overwhelming yes well over half of you so um thanks for sticking around to the end of this webinar thank you so much to megan for your presentation which was very thought-provoking and and thanks to Francisco for stepping in at such short notice and for being such a great panellist. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you all again on future webinars. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Megan. Bye. Thank you, Shit. Great. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And thank you to Joe, Megan, and Francisco for presenting today. Um, if there is anything that you heard in today's webinar that you would like to share, again, there is our uh, social um, handle as well as a hashtag you could use to share what you want. And as Joe mentioned, if you are an IAIA member, feel free to put something in the hub as well, our online community about this webinar, and start that conversation there as well. Like Joe said, there were plenty of questions that didn't get answered, and so it'd be fun to start that conversation in the hub. And just a reminder that in a day or two, you'll be receiving an email with recordings as, along with the slides. And additionally, as you leave here today, you're gonna to be prompted to answer a survey and give us some feedback. We would really appreciate that. The question specifically asks about other topics that you'd like to hear about in the future. So again, if you, you know, if maybe you thought that it'd be helpful to get more of a primer on this topic or an extension of this topic, 
or just a completely different topic, we'd love to hear your suggestions and try to get a webinar on the books for that. So thank you again for joining. We know your time is valuable and I really appreciate you spending your time here with us today and we'll see you next time. Have a good day.